When I think about poetry and what it is, there are so many definitions. John Ciardi, who has a whole collection of poems defining how a poem means, and he was quite a craftsman, said once when he was asked what is poetry, he said, look world, I'm dancing. Robert Frost said, prose says one thing and means it. Poetry says one thing and means it but it means something else too. So that's the distinction. Um, poetry rides a little bit more on the music of the words and also much of the imagery is used metaphorically. In other words, it has some inner feeling to it. Person identifies with it, sees that part of themselves. For instance, the rose from Robert Burns. Um, My love is like a red, red rose. Well, the petals of the rose are the female erotic symbol, and the stem of the rose is the male. Um, so there, there's a lot of symbolism built into a lot of poetry. Some of the poetry that I write, if people think about just the simple image of a rose and the stem, they might get that connection. But poetry, I, I think, simply is metaphor. It says what it means, but it means something else, too. And how do I work on my poems? I do some translating. Quite often I will start with something that's quite prosy and um, want to rework it, set it aside. One of the poems I was working on, I had a phrase that didn't work at all, and it was a commissioned poem. I had to have it in. It was published. And this one phrase troubled me so much. I was talking with some other friends about it till maybe 10 at night. I stayed up till 1 working on other things. I was quite tired, but I said, tomorrow Saturday I can stay in bed till 9 in the morning. <clears throat> That's good. At 7 o'clock, the words came. The words came because the subconscious mind was working on it. Um, I pay attention to that. I try to keep a dream journal, go to that. But reworking the poems, so they mean what they say, but they say something else, too. Thank you, Lorna. I hope people will realize what a treasure this library has up in this room. In fact, look at all the women poets back here. Hilda is here. Uh, Susan Deal, who will be reading next month. So I recommend those readings to you. A lot of... A lot of good women poets up here. A lot of good men poets in this room. <laughs> and their books are here, too. Thank you, everybody, for coming. You realize some of you could be in Omaha hearing Bill Kittredge read. You could be in front of your television watching the ball game, going to the circus, starting your corned beef and cabbage on St. Pat's night. <clears throat> the poems in Polar Lights do give varying points of view of what experiences I had, of the experiences that I had while I was in Alaska for most of 11 years. The, there's an Oriental poet, and I've been asking this question for 10 years, and no one can tell me, who said, you can best see the seashore from the mountain. I know I read it. Maybe I dreamed it, but it was an Oriental poet, I think. I liked it so very much because while I was in Alaska, I wrote very many Nebraska poems. I could best see the seashore of Nebraska from the mountains of Alaska. In fact, I tell people I live on the east coast of Nebraska. <laughs> okay, and there are quite a few of um, those poems in this book. Uh, as well, though, the first and last poem in that book have both Alaska and Nebraska in them. The poems uh, in Polar Lights, sometimes Nebraska surfaces in them, but I am speaking in each poem always, if it, even if it is predominantly um, narrative, 
the imagery I'm thinking of them, uh, the imagery symbolically in some way, emblematically or uh, metaphorically. This is a place poem, perhaps you call a place poem. It is camping by the Chattanooga, the interior. The Chattanooga is a river up a little no uh, northwest of Fairbanks, which is about 360, 400 miles from Anchorage. Maybe it's not that far, but it takes eight hours to get there. Um, a beautiful place. In any case, I'm thinking of the river, and I'm thinking of the interior, both metaphorically and literally in this poem. Shadow, the inner and outer realities of shadow. Oh, I will say one thing. I said it in my last reading from this book. It's dedicated to my parents, uh, David and Esther Hill, who are both now deceased, that every time I use the word hill or see the word hill, I think that I'm in it, that it's in me. So that's in this first line. You know more about that line than most people will. <laughs> Camping by the Chattanooga, the interior. How the shadow of an entire hill comes a tree at a time, climbs up and over us, crosses the river, the land beyond, then rolls on, overtaking the forests and distant ranges of the White Mountains. Now it is we who are full of motion, folded together. A pair of minks, dark as bark, come from the river, turn back, swim off. Just so we go in sleep, Great waters pass beside us. When we wake, we will have passed through to some new place. In this valley, should no sunlight arrive and half the sky come down in cloud over these domes, we'll take to ourselves what is half seen, the mountain of the future, further off than the eye can see. How the shadow of the object changes, not the essence, of the thing itself. <clears throat> while I was in Alaska, move this down. While I was in Alaska, I did travel for the Arts Council and for colleges as well, and I went to Ketchikan, which is in southeast Alaska. I'm drawing Alaska so you can see it. This is southeast and this is Canada, and this is Alaska. So you can get to these places only by air or by um, plane. I was in Ketchikan only two weeks. <clears throat> it is another place for uh, the Native Americans there, particularly because they are striving for the very things that our Native Amer Americans lost on this country a hundred years ago. The people in Alaska are still fighting for their languages, for their land. This is Ketchikan. Beyond a moon eclipse not seen by reason of the constant snow, the spell of students writing poems, some scenes persist and magnify. Totem Bight Park in a meadow, poles and longhouse emblazoned with colors from clamshells, charcoal, copper, ferric oxide. More recently, enamel-like paints obscuring the carver's craft, intruding. The home of a gold rush madam, now a bath boutique, museum, or jewelry shop, perhaps. The trade, a different sort of lust. And in the city center, a single totem with various animals, the faces not so clear. Say they were frog straddling turtle, with bear, raven, and eagle rising to blue eyes, peering out from a white man's face. This face, a certain recollection. Big nose, black beard. He wore a stovepipe hat. When I asked, was told, the Haida, many of us artists and carvers, were slaves of the Klingit tribe. It's Abe Lincoln freed our people. In school, their young ones, bound to learn American concerns, go home to elders, telling old ways in a fading tongue. <coughs> a 
letter to Cordova, and that also is in southeast. I was there for two weeks, and it rained north to south, parallel to the ground until the last day and the clouds all lifted and the mountains were snow covered around it it really was gorgeous country but i didn't know it for a while <clears throat> letter to cordova tourists have no call to scribble words about your place so i send this gloss of one dimension rain and wind cover the dock only the figures of a few friends emerge years of loss great harvests of fish are stories only the Copper River, the mines, are yours. They are no part of me. I'm the Spaniard on reconnaissance who gave this place its illusory name, then ambled on. I leave you to your own well-traveled map. Bring word of movements, undercurrents we each know. Here we let down nets, become less than strangers, leaning together in words of welcome, thanks, and parting. In Haines, Alaska, likely if you have TV and have seen or any uh, tourist magazines, you do see all the eagles that are there. It's quite a sight to see, but um, the Klingit tribe is made up of two peoples, one, two clans. One is the Klingit, or the Klingit, one is the eagle clan, and one is the raven. They have to marry out of their clan. A raven cannot marry a raven. Uh, an eagle cannot marry an eagle because the raven is the scavenger, the peacemaker. The eagle is the one with the power and the aggressiveness, so they have to have that. Um, this is a poem a little bit about learning the old ways. Figures, Port Chilkoot. Klingit blood broods here over black cottonwood carved into raven and eagle. Strokes filled with shadows, hollows with feathers, eyes of totems with bones cra cracked into oblivion by wind, many passages of the moon. To catch the old dreams, these carvers reach for facts in books and photographs, hands of artist fathers stilled and buried in the Wrangell Mountains. In the woods by Chilkat River, eagles wait in every tree, Ravens cry behind harp strings of rain. The big fluffy state, uh, big fluffy flakes. Who would ever say that again? Never. Big flakes of snow, very fluffy. <laughs> Many people call feathers, right? You know, oh, it's, it's snowing feathers. You see that, at least I see it in student poems quite often. Well, when I saw these, they were so huge and so much bigger. And we're almost petal upon petal. This is my first winter in Alaska, and to give you some of the exoticness of it, I want to first explain that sun dogs nod your head if you know what sun dogs are. Okay, well, I don't know that I've ever seen them in Nebraska. The sun here, and ice fog and clouds, and the mirror image, or not image, it's like the rainbow golden uh, glint, rainbow colors of the sun on either side. And it would stay that way for a long, long time. Actually, I did see some ones coming home from Omaha. Well, anyway, white blossoms fall. Call it snow if you must, but the sky becomes tropical. Sun dogs glowing the colors of Tahiti. The cold, thick, and seductive as any air in the South Pacific. Lagoon blues of sky and water. Maroon hues of mountains. The flashing auroras at midnight over Skelac Lake, how they arrange themselves in a painting by Gauguin, a sarong of tundra flowers, and not salmon, the flash of flowers in Kenai River. If ever permafrost finds me and I lie abandoned in some drift, it will be a hammock strung between two palm trees. I will put myself adrift there, and all the snow a tropical moon every wind the call of some fierce bright bird that's the first winter in anchorage by the third winter things change a little four hours of daylight in this one third winter in anchorage there's also a sleeping lady mountain and that's probably a thousand miles from the other sleeping lady over the inlet Cook Inlet. 
Within four hours, the sun both rises and sets. Beyond the mud flat, Mount Susitna, sleeping lady, turns her head from the red wedge in her heart, the last of the sun cutting it. One legend tells a Romeo and Juliet story, lovers separated by family quarrels. She faces west, watching for his return, as I for yours from the east. A winter moon glides above and shatters too on the broken inlet ice. Tree branches grow ice crystals moment by moment. I do not know yet what living here means. I do have a couple of poems in this book that I'm reading from tonight um, where you really can see Nebraska was on my mind while I was in Alaska. Also, just because of the place name, Nebraska, and I'm not sure if it's Sioux or Pawnee, but it is a Native American language, and it means land of the uh, broad, flat waters. Alaska means the great land. So there is that pull and that heritage that predates the people who say, oh, my parents have been on this land for 100 years. Huh. The cranes have been here 10 million years. The Pony and the Sioux have been on this land um, uh, many centuries, sometimes a thousand. It varies. Archaeologists disagree on that. So that's a connection, you see, between Alaska and Nebraska. My concern about the native people, which surfaces in an earlier book in Nebraska, and now in this book, Polar Lights, I will be reading some things about native concerns, losses, world of loss and uh, lament for some of those peoples. Forget the sky, and this is Anchorage. My point of view. Clouds and still air, which means storms coming elsewhere, though here predict nothing but more of the same, hang as a foreboding overhead. Only 66 days a year of sun part sun in Anchorage, so you ask for thunder and lightning, which come only once or so a decade. High winds whipping up unexpectedly are a nice break, and quarreling is better than loneliness when hoarfrost on trees remains 10 days or longer. Keeping your nose to the same old grind, not looking up and away searching for blue, is good for the spirit. Birch leaves falling bring yellow days. Smiling like the proverbial fool, you can trick yourself into believing you don't miss the sun or the tempest. Or you can become expressionless, saying nothing, forgetting the ones who love you would welcome your walking under ladders, extending the spell against ennui by tempting a black cat across your path, courting the devil, danger, death in any order. The safest choice, if you're old enough or have earned the right, is to stay in bed, a pillow over your head, living as cats or birds who honor such days and themselves by hiding, curling into balls, slipping their heads between paws or under wings, dozing in the certainty of the present. Beyond your retreats and regrets, new sorrows accumulate, behaving like stars, choosing the right space in your sky, creating a new constellation, depending on the season. Raspberry thickets. These are things that I've listened to all my life. You know, the wind comes in Nebraska through the cottonwood, and then it comes through the elm, and then it comes through the oak, and how it sounds different. Well, those things I'd listen to and never put them in a poem. This is raspberry thicket. Overhead, a difference in the wind's voice as it moves from pine to cottonwood to spruce, through birch to alder, and leaves untouched these brambles. Out of the harsh storm, I crouch in prickly green, fill your old red line Stetson with berries, deepening the stain. Since placing a single one in my mouth, Hood Canal years ago, a change in your voice, your words to me. Turning, I see the blue of your shirt by the lake where you fish for grayling. You in one weather, I in another. 
You, loving the force of this gale I hide from. There are many miles to be traveled if you go any place in Alaska. Um, a lot of miles. Driving from Fairbanks down through the Glen Highway into Anchorage. Uh, there's plenty of snow. Seeing plenty of snow. Watching the tracks in the snow. Caribou, Slanislu, Alaska. Sometimes you just get out of the car to see them. In the roadside snow, few tracks show in a straight line. A curve left, watching. A turn right, stopping for a scent on the wind. And beyond, two sets of prints perform a ceremonial dance. A chain with a knot in the center. The shock of recognition, as Aristotle wrote. Something prefigured here in the white silence, the tracks veering off singularly, leaving the circle. Female and male were they, as we, the two of us, startled, looking long into the deep of those animal depressions, and then down below the mountain, where a herd of several hundred moved across the Copper River. So far away, each one smaller than the half moon on my ring finger. On the way to Toke, neither of us spoke for hours. I almost, in this poem, spelled it T-O-K-E. That's how it's pronounced. It's spelled, that wouldn't be true or real. They spell it T-O-K. Might look like talk to us. Well, that's all right. Maybe it picks up the music from Copper River. I don't know. But on the way to Toke, <laughs> neither of us spoke. Another one is um, Kluwani Lake. And it looks like Kluwane. But it's pronounced Kluwani Lake. Words lead to themselves, and when the words are over, lavender branches in the snow, this lake a turquoise stone, a veil of slate over the mountains, a cloud the shape of an eagle rises, elongates, becomes serpent, coyote, crossing the road. Oh, the lake of turquoise stone because of the volcano eruptions centuries ago and the rivers and lakes, many of them do, turn that turquoise blue color, uh, aqua blue, slate blue. It's very beautiful. Autumn, the salmon. Willowa is a cold wind that comes down on flat land in a northern hemisphere, and that's where I was here. Silvers in this poem is silver salmon. Turnigan arm is where Captain Cook came and had to turn around, but it's not two words, turn again. They all, ha it's one word and everybody says turnigan arm. Okay, pods of belugas, not schools of belugas, not flocks of belugas, but pods of beluga. Fry are the small salmon. Autumn the salmon. At Willowa Creek, I photographed two silvers, named one Gypsy Flamenco, the other Red Harp. When I pointed the camera your way, you turned, moved out of range, kept silent. Finally, I decided no more pictures. Approach and loss, never captured, held fast. Later, from the tent, and quiet next to you, I took notes. The filigree of black cottonwoods against the sky, the first leaves falling. On Turnigan Arm, pods of belugas rode, uh, rolled up the tide, feeding on Fry, who would not make it back. So this then is home, the distance between birth and death and ocean, and time now, the distance between us. The last poem, and it is entitled, uh, it's not the last poem in the book, but for tonight, Polar Lights with a small line from Primo Levi. You don't have to go to Alaska to see something marvelous. That's a Nebraskan talking. That's why I came back. <laughs>
The first day of summer here on the plains, still 80 degrees at 2 a.m., and I'm on my way into Toke, Alaska, wanting a pair of Athabascan moccasins. So much hoarfrost on trees that coming into the valley, I think we're in love, and we are at 14 below. Native women, eyes inscrutably oriental, look away. The pair fits. At home, the closet smells of urine. It's the cure they use, you tell me. They sit on the porch two seasons till the odor is gone. We were great together for a time. Eventually, we put down our Yukon Jack. Our days parallel the Arctic Circle. Twelve years later, holes worn in the soles, sitting on a shelf next to poetry books, it all smells of nothing but winter. Sometimes memory brings me things that never happened, never will occur, that we could be friends again. But you, the tundra below, Borealis above, sweeping the past in refracted light. Me, my deep blue skies, my star-filled nights, five steps behind nothing so much as myself, the pleasure of my solitary company. What if it's true as a child drawn into the street of a small Nebraska town looking north, I saw them, the auroras, beckoning in hot July, longing for the cold and someone like you. Now, I lied when I said it was going to be a last poem because I'm going to read the one that has Nebraska in it. <laughs> Written on the Gulf of Alaska for my father, 1905-1971. Smelling the rain on corn, our car windows down. Watching the threshers move by moonlight, we drove the roads from town. Autumn, stopping for bittersweet at the edge of sorghum. Shortly after your death, thoughts of you moved in my mind as wind over a field of wheat. Standing on the beach in the sun, scanning the tide, I swear to banish all memory of the prairie lose myself in the skiff on the horizon. But a breeze touches this body of water as if it too were a field, grain, or shifting sand. Well, when I think of um, someone hearing my poems, in fact, I wrote a letter to a friend who felt that writing poetry was to win someone over to his turf. And so I wrote this response, which ended up being an essay, and it is in uh, one of the Alaska anthologies for grant winners, as well as poems. That essay is in there, and I polished it up. I called it Practicing the Poem. I studied classical piano, and I taught classical piano. So listening to the music of the poem is important to me. And also, playing the piano is diversionary, in a way. You want to entertain people. You want... Uh, to give them something from Debussy, which is um, impressionistic, or s something by Bach, which is very formal. And those things influenced me in my writing because I write different sorts of poems. So I had all of that in the essay to s compare the writing of poetry to playing the piano. I'm just practicing. I'm just practicing the poem. That's the title of the essay, until I get it right. Question. Did you, you were about to, to say something. Did you ever go to the Palmer Fair? Oh, yeah. That's beautiful. Have you been there, Fred? Yeah, yeah. But were you impressed with the fact that I've never seen vegetables that big anywhere on the planet? Mm -hmm. How do they do that? There's no growing seed. I, I, don't, I never could find Well, them. they bank up the roots so the sun, which doesn't set. See, in the, in the winter, oh, yeah. it comes up like yeah. this. Yeah. In the summer, the moon comes up like this. In the winter, um, or in the summer, then, the sun, west, glides along that horizon, even as far south as Anchorage, goes overhead and goes like this. Doesn't set. So it's there all the time, and they just build these little piles around their tomato bushes and potatoes, and it gets heat all the time and the sun all the time, and mild temperatures right there, maybe 70 degrees is warm. So that's why they grow big. I always wanted to write a poem. Plenty of daylight. The way those the salmon go in like those streams uh -huh. around Palmer are so battered. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Kenai Peninsula so too. Gorgeous. Mm -hmm. But I've never been able to capture them. Well, you will if it's on your mind. <laughs> they are. They are like old 
war horses. Well, maybe we ought to read Elizabeth Bishop's The Fish, saying old war horses, because she has something similar in that poem. Write it and let me know. There are so many poets who have encouraged me right here in Lincoln. And uh, I'm thinking of the ones who were my teachers, Greg Kuzma and Bill Clefcorn. I'm thinking of National Pulitzer Prize winning poet Carolyn Kaiser, who writes uh, just wonderful poems. I recommend her poems to everybody. Uh, my fellow poets, Susan Deal, who's going to be reading next week or next month here. Uh, showing poems to my fellow poets. Teaching keeps me on the, my toes. That influences me. I think probably the best teacher is reading. Another good teacher is listening to the self, to the world, to the language other people use. Listening to dreams. When I work as a poet in the schools, it really is very demanding, but it's also something that I love, and students continually surprise me, even the ones who say they don't give a rat's left ear about poetry. I'm usually able to win them over by the model poems that I read. I get tired of using the same models, of course, so I'm continually reading to find new models that the students will like. I've read New Yorker poems to kindergartners, and they will write from it. You just have to find the right poem that speaks to everybody. I don't use, by and large, I don't only really use children's poetry. And that's what's startling. That's what's startling to me. And that keeps me growing and learning, I think. In fact, that poem is Richard Shelton's poem. Um, Five lies about the moon. Anyway, so there are five lies about the moon. Kindergartners, this was in the New Yorker. And the kindergartners write to it from it. <laughs> when I think about poetry and what it might communicate to other people, I think, by and large, well, we know poetry is one of the most neglected art forms. Didn't used to be. It used to be paramount. Lyric poetry was part of everyone's life. Um, television, radio, many things have changed that. I would like people to realize that in poetry they will recognize themselves in all their aspects. I'm talking about that play, a sense of play in the Richard Shelton poem about the moon. Also, uh, St. John of the Cross, it's always two o'clock in the dark night of the soul. We are there in poems in the wide range of emotion that we have, and we are in such a busy world that we don't have time to stop and listen to the self. And that's, and our fellow people, not just the self, of course, but the sense of communication. And I have the feeling that although many of us writing today are not, um, Many poets are not well received. They're struggling to get it right. I like to think what Gary Snyder, who's also a Pulitzer Prize winning poet and an acquaintance, used to be a friend, but I haven't seen him and his wife for years. But he said, there is room for many singers. And I really, really believe that, that each of us on our own level is struggling to get it right with language, which makes us different than any of the other animals. We better learn to use it.